where he's scheduled for 45 minutes. It might, you know, be a little bit more, maybe go right about an hour, but, um, you know, obviously jump in or jump off when you got to jump off. Um, please mute, mute your phones. I'm on the mute all function, but I think it'll be easier for you to hear if you mute your phones. This is a seven-part webinar. It's really going to be focused more on mechanical seal reliability, but I think to properly understand mechanical seal reliability, it's good to at least have some very basic understandings of centrifugal pumps and how they operate. And, and I'm going to emphasize uh, uh, fundamentals because that's really, this is a pretty basic presentation as you'll see uh, as we get into it. Uh, there's a question kind of chat bar that you can type in questions. I'll try to answer questions as we're going along. If I can't field them all, I'll try to field them at the end. If I don't get to your question, you have my email address right there. Please send me an email or Sherry McNamara. It's S-M-C-N-A-M-A-R-A -A -A at SealEquipment.com. I'm directly back to you via email. Um, and the, this webinar, including the audio, the PowerPoint and the audio, will be on uh, our website, SeerEquipment.com, at the conclusion. So you can go take a look at it anytime you can. All right. Uh, we're, we're doing this in conjunction with FlowServe, uh, but uh, for, again, for this initial hydraulic presentation, it's going to be just me. Appreciate everybody uh, attending. So let's get the ball rolling. Okay, and I can't move. Oh, there we go. Okay, <laughs> all right. All right, so a centrifugal pump adds energy, but really it's energy via pressure to a fluid. So it moves fluid, but obviously it doesn't create fluid. What it creates is pressure. High pressure, low flow, vice versa. You know, all, within reason, almost any flow and pressure that you need to get you need to get to in an application you can find a pump to suit to to suit those needs and uh, we'll talk a little bit about um, operating point reliability uh, failure modes and really energy use are, are driven a lot on where you run a centrifugal pump so in the upper right you'll see uh, a pump curve 99 percent of centrifugal pump curves look like this. They, they may vary a little bit. Obviously, flows and pressures are different, but this is how they look. On the x-axis is flow, usually expressed in gallons per minute, and on the y-axis is pressure, and it's expressed exclusively in TDH, total developed head. We'll, in a couple slides, we'll get to the difference between pressure and head. But right now, let's just call it pressure couple important points about centrifugal pump curves. Number one, they're dynamic. Dynamic meaning that pump can run anywhere on that curve. So, you know, this could be a uh, flow serve two by, you know, three by two eight Mark III ANSI pump with an eight inch impeller. This would represent the eight inch impeller right here. It can run here, 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 way back here. It can't run here, out here, or down here. It has to run on whatever impeller diameter is in that pump. How, where it runs on that curve is dependent upon where your system allows it to run. And maybe a half an hour into this presentation, we'll get into system curves and how that curve intersects the pump curve. Another kind of way that I like to say it is centrifugal pumps are dumb. They will just follow wherever your system allows it to follow, okay? So, I'm sorry. Let me back up. I'm sorry. I, did, I forgot to talk about this, my couple little pictures here. So, let's look at this upper right-hand picture. I have, a, I have my hose, or I have my finger, and it's, you know, it's on the hose. It's halfway over the hose. When it's halfway over the hose, there's a certain flow coming out, right? And then there's a certain corresponding pressure coming out. Obviously, the, the more I put my finger over the hose, I'm restricting it more. So the less the flow, but, you know, but, but the longer that that water is actually tra is traveling outside, outside of the hose to my petunias, right, uh, out in my garden. 
I take my finger all the way off the hose, much more flow because I'm, re I'm not restricting any longer, but obviously the, the, pr the, the pressure is lower or the fluid is not traveling as far. All right, so if we can kind of understand that, replace my finger with a discharge control valve, you know, somewhere on the discharge of your system, and here's what we have. So my finger's halfway over that hose, or you have your check valve halfway closed. For this specific example, we're running at 50 gallons per minute at 30 feet of head, all right, our pressure. Now I take my finger and I push it three quarters of the way over the hose. All right, so really what I'm doing is I'm changing the system dynamics. So where does my pump go? And you can very clearly see my pump goes pushed over to the left. Now does that make sense? I'm restricting the flow, right? Three quarters of my finger over the hose. So I'm going from 50 gallons a minute down, in this case 20. Yet I'm increasing my pressure, right? So instead of going 30 feet straight up in the air, that, that column of water, that hose of water, it's going to go, again in my example, it's 45 feet, all right? Less flow, more pressure. Now, I take my finger and I push it all the way over the hose. Or you completely close your discharge check valve. Where does my pump go? goes all the way over. I mean, this is an easy one, right? I have, I have completely restricted my flow. I'm at zero gallons per minute. So I'm at what we refer to in the pump world is I'm at shut off. In this case, I'm up around 60 feet of head, right, right here at zero flow. All right. So what happens to my pump at shut off? All right. Everything you see here, instability, heat generation, vibration. All right. So let's say I have a 100 horsepower pump and motor, right? So all 100 horsepower, all that energy of that motor is going into that pump and driving that pump. Well, one of the, one of the things, among other, that the fluid actually does when it transfers in and out of the pump is it dissipates heat. It takes some of the heat that is transferred into that pump and it dissipates it and it brings it downstream, all right? And that's what keeps, helps keep the pump cool. So now if you close your discharge valve all the way, two things are happening, right? No flow is going through to dissipate all that heat. So now all that heat is getting built up in your bearing frame, in your, on your uh, radial and your thrust bearings, in your oil or your grease, more importantly in your mechanical seal. It's, that heat travels right down that shaft, right through your bearings, right in your mechanical seal. So that's the first thing that happens because you don't have any cooling dissipating that heat or bringing it away from the pump. But the second thing that happens is now you have a confined amount of fluid in the casing of your pump. And you're, you're in a sense, let's say you're injecting 100 horsepower worth of heat also into that fluid. Well, when you add energy to a fluid and you don't move any of it out, what happens? It, the temperature raises. So if that temperature is 50 degrees, pretty soon at 100 horsepower, it's going to be 200 degrees. If it's, if it's already 180, 190 degree boiler feed water, you got about 30 seconds and then you're going to start flashing. When you start flashing, you have all sorts of trouble internally in, in your pump. So there's really two different phenomena, for lack of a better phrase, that happen when you run that pump at shutoff. Not only do you get have all that, but for every, for the entire pressure that's leaving the pump, there's an equal and opposite pressure or force acting down upon that pump. So in the case of, let's say it's an overhung pump, right? It's, it's a shaft that has an impeller that's overhung. It's an overhung load. You have the highest radial loading that you can possibly get on that shaft and impeller pushing down. And when you do that, now you think of all the, you know, the radial movement that you put and, well, it's really radial and axial, but radial movement that you put on that shaft, now you start um, affecting and bouncing your mechanical seal around. And really, probably before you fail anything else in the pump, that mechanical seal is going to fail. Um, and I guess I forgot to mention one other issue with the whole 
um, with the closed valve from a from a liquid standpoint. Once you heat that fluid up enough to start vaporizing it, now a lot of that vapor goes back into the seal area, and now you have a dry running seal, right? So between dry running seal faces and then the radial and axial loading that you get, basically you're running the pump in, in, a, in a hydraulically unstable part of the pump, you're going to get premature failure. So that's really what happens when you run the pump shut off. Here's my, here's my, uh, here's my recommendation to everybody. Don't run pumps that shut off. Um, all right, now I'm going to take my finger or your discharge valve, and I'm going to take it, and I'm going to take it three quarters of the way off the hose. Right? What happens? I run. Actually, right, we started way up here initially at shut off. Now we're going to run way back down to here. Right? And again, intuitively that makes sense. Less restriction, more flow, but the fluid's not going 60 feet up in the air. It's going, in this case, only 15 feet up in the air. All right. So I've I've run that pump all the way now out to the right part of the curve, right part of the curve. More flow, less pressure. Take it 100% off the hose. Okay. What happens if you have a system that where you do not have a lot of of dynamic head restriction? You know, let's say it's a relatively low flow and you have pretty big pipe diameter, so you really don't have much restriction. The system's going to allow that pump to run all the way out to the right, all the way off the curve, like we see right here. All right. So what happens to a pump when it runs out there? Well, I'll tell you what happens. In theory, you don't know because you run so far out on that curve, you actually don't know now what kind of flow you're actually getting. And a flow meter now is very hard to read that. And you're bouncing your pressure gauge around so much, you probably don't have an accurate reading of what your pressure is. But what you do know is you're riding, again, in a very, very hydraulically unstable part of the pump. One of the biggest things that, that can happen is pure cavitation. And you know, cavitation, the whole concept of cavitation is a whole other hour seminar. But basically, it's when you can't provide enough pressure internally in the pump to overcome all the pressure drops in that pump and all the hydraulic instabilities in that pump, if you can't, if there's not enough pressure to keep that liquid in liquid form, then it turns to vapor. All right, so it turns to vapor. That's not the damage that it causes. Once that vapor bear, that bubble, and there's thousands of them, now travels up the vein, there's a conversion of velocity energy to pressure energy, which we don't need to remember that. But that, that vapor now, tr that vapor bubble compresses back into liquid form, and that's where the 10,000 PSI and above tiny little pressure nick hits your casing face and hits your impeller. So when you see a casing or an impeller that looks like you took a little hammer and chisel and just chipped away at the metal, that's not usually erosive wear or corrosive wear. It's pure cavitation because of the pressure that that bubble going back into liquid puts on that metal. Uh, doesn't always happen. It's a function of NPSH, but, but that happens quite a lot. But the same other things happen. Hydraulic instability, a lot of vibration. Right? You have a 50-gallon a minute pump that you're trying to get 110 or 120 gallons a minute, let's say, through it. Well, it can't do it. So now you're really bouncing that shaft all around, and you're really not starting to affect that shaft and those bearings. So the two things we don't want to do, number one, run a pump at shutoff, and number two, run a pump way out to run out. Okay? And how far we determine run out is, we'll address here in a couple slides. Okay? So where do you run your centrifugal pump? I don't know if, if maximum allowable operating range is an industry term or just a Jerry Connolly term. I don't know. Maybe I should trademark it. But, but really, let's start talking about the maximum allowable operating range of a pump. What is it? I mean, how far to the left and how far to the right can you run a centrifugal pump? Well, like any good lawyer, and I'm not one, it depends on a ton of things what pump it is, what size, what all the fluid dynamic, all, you know, everything that's involved with the fluid, temperature, 
what the horsepower is, right? We talked about, we'll talk about small horsepower versus large horsepower, what the manufacturer recommendations are, what type of pump it is, a, you know, a 12-stage, multi-stage, double-case barrel pump on boiler feed has different operating ranges than a five horsepower overhung chemical process pump regarding range within that specific curve. So there's a lot that goes into it. But if we want to have a general conversation, the higher the horsepower, the smaller the operating range. And, and again, you know, the theorists can kind of pick this to death, but generally speaking, the bigger the pump goes, you start to restrict how far back and forth on that yellow curve I showed you on the very first or second slide can go. So let's take a look here. So I hope you can see the far outside, you know, high left and low right little asterisks are blue. And they associate with the first bullet. Very low horsepower. Let, I just picked one to seven and a half. So if you have a small horsepower machine, you just have to think about the relative energy that you're putting into the pump. So let's say on this curve we're looking at, the minimum flow that you're, you're not supposed to go past is 10 gallons a minute, let's say, over to the left, right, over here. Right? So we're going to draw a line right here. We're going to say you can't go to the left of 10 gallons a minute. Okay. So now you're going to run this pump at 5 gallons a minute or 3 gallons a minute. Well, that's not good, but it's relative. Let's say the pump has a two horsepower motor on it, it's running 1800 RPM and you're on 60 degree water. Well, how much energy are you possibly going to put into that machine that's going to significantly overcome the heat that's being generated by only putting two gallons of per minute of water through the pump, right, to dissipate heat, as opposed to 10 or 20 or 30 or 50. So am I telling you you can run that pump at two gallons a minute all day every day? Absolutely not. But you have a much, much wider uh, window of, of error, you know, margin of error on that small pump? You absolutely do. And the same goes, for, the same is true for when you bring it down here to the right. So now you're way down here to the right. Maybe you're cavitating a little. You're trying to bounce that all around. But you're talking about a pretty small pump. And that pump usually smaller pumps, generally speaking, because you have to be a certain size just to be able to, to make a casing and an impeller that can pass flow, you typically have much stockier uh, shafts. You have much closer bearing, uh, bearing distances. So the distance between the back thrust bearing and the radial bearing is a short distance. The distance between the, the front bearing, the radial bearing, and the impeller uh, overhang is short. So it's a much more compact design. So even though you're putting high radial load on that, the tendency is that it can just be a little more robust and it can handle that that type of, of, of I guess I'll say, abuse. Again, is it true in all cases? Absolutely not. Do you want to run it there all day every day? Absolutely not, but it is relative. Now, so now you guys get the picture, right? So now if we go to the black uh, little asterisk in the middle, again, I, I pick 10 horse to 50. It could be 10 to 60 or 75. I don't know. Again, it's relative. The point is you're adding more horsepower and more energy into the system, so you can't run that pump way back. You know, let's say on the, on the, it's a 50 horsepower pump, so this minimum flow line, I'm sorry, this minimum flow line now is, well, I don't know, let's say it's 30 gallons a minute or 40 gallons a minute. So you don't want to run at 30 or 40 gallons a minute, but, but you can probably run at 25 gallons a minute, but you can run there for maybe for a couple of minutes where the, on the very low horsepower, you could run there for several hours, right? And the same holds true as you go out. And then as you get into significantly higher horsepowers, that band stops that much, you know, gets that much closer. Right, so you think of again. Let's say it's a it's a thousand horsepower, multi eight stage, multi stage, uh, a split case pump for boiler feed. Right, and your impeller rings and your case rings are running six or eight thousandths apart from one another. 
um, you're pumping, you know, pre almost boiling uh, temperature uh, water, right? So once you start moving a little bit off to the left of that curve and you start restricting the flow, the impact or the potential impact on that pump is far more dramatic, right? And then what happens is, and this could be a multi-stage or just any big pump, right, high energy pump, you have the casing rings which are attached to the casing. So let's just, in, in one, you know, let's just call it one integral piece, right? You have a casing bottom and a casing top. They're very big, heavy uh, pieces of metal. Running in those, you have these impellers with the impeller rings, which is a much smaller piece of metal, right? I mean, I don't know, a thousand pounds versus each in, in, in impeller might weigh fifty pounds. So as you start heating that up, and it heats up. For, and, and that temperature starts to heat up because you're running to the left, which of those two parts is going to grow quicker? Well, the impeller and the impeller ring is going to grow quicker. And you don't have a lot of leeway before that impeller expands to the point where now your impeller ring jumps into your case ring, seizes, and now you have a, a big mess. I mean, now that's why they put case rings in, so you can just take the case rings and the impeller rings off and replace them. You haven't damaged the casing but you kind of get the point about how you need to restrict a little bit more of that flow uh, as you get bigger horsepower. All right, I think I've beaten that to death. So, again, let's talk about head now, right? So, on positive displacement pumps, we talk pressure. So why in centrifugal pumps do we talk head or total developed head instead of pressure? Well, the answer is right down below. It's because of specific gravity. So if there's, if there's two formulas that I'll ask that you write down, one is TDH. So head is pressure times a constant, 2.31, divided by the specific gravity of a fluid. So let's look at these three examples. Over on the left, you have water, 68 degrees, 1.0 gravity, 43 PSI on the gauge. 43 times 2.31, divide your specific gravity, which is 1. You'll pump that 100 feet straight up into the air. Okay. Now, you walk across the plant, and you have a different application. In this application, you're pumping sulfuric acid, 1.8 specific gravity. Okay. Now, you look at that gauge, and that gauge says the same thing, 43 PSI. You must think, huh, well, that must be going up 100 feet also, because that's what the water one did. All right, pressure is pressure. Not the case with a centrifugal pump. 43 times 2.31 is 100, divide by 1.8. Now you're down to 55 feet of head. So the same pressure gauge reading, you're doing 55 feet worth of work at the, let's say, at the same horsepower as the water pump is doing 100 feet of work. All right. So, so I think um, intuitively that would make sense that. For the same horsepower, you're going to do you're going to go less vertical feet with a heavier fluid, right? I think that that conceptually should make sense. And then over on the far right, gasoline, which has a uh, I'm sorry, my toolbar's in the way, so it has a uh, gravity of 0 0.75. Same calculation. Now you're going up 133 feet. This is why we talk in terms of total developed head and why it's critically important to understand and know what the specific gravity is of a fluid that you're pumping if you're going to be using a centrifugal pump. Not a real big deal in the water wastewater industry, right? Even sludges when they're in the form of, you know, raw water intake, usually very close to one. Obviously all water applications are one. Water plants are pretty easy. But once you get into chemical plants, petrochemical, from mining, right, uh, refining, then you then you start pumping chem more and more chemicals. Then you need, or if you're in a wastewater plant and you're doing a a, um, a chemical transfer application, so you're not injecting hypo, but you're transferring it from tank to tank. Now you need to know what specific gravity is. Okay, so we've talked about flow head the shape of a curve, uh, specific gravity. Now let's talk about horsepower. All right. Here's the other formula that I'd ask you to 
just kind of write down. All right. So how do you calculate what the machine is going to cons consume from a horsepower perspective? BHP, brake horsepower. It's your head times your flow times their specific gravity divided by a constant. And then obviously, no pump is 100% efficient, so you need to know what the pump efficiency is. So uh, notice that the pump efficiency and, and the constant is in the, the denominator, OK? Oh, I'm sorry. I think that I think that one might have been out of. I apologize. I think that one might have been out of sequence. Well, let, let's let's address it. This is a different way to state or to look at specific gravity. I apologize, folks. Let's look at this a, a little different twist on this same analysis. So, in the middle, I apologize. Here, the water's now in the middle. So, in the water application, right? I'm 100 feet, 43 psi. Sulfuric acid, remember, it's, it's heavier. So to get the same 100 feet, notice I need almost 80 PSI, right? So for me to do 100 feet of water, I need 10 horsepower. For me to do 100 feet of sulfuric acid, I need 18 horsepower. And again, that intuitively, I think, should make sense. Who cares what the, what, what the, the calculation is? Intuitively, it should make sense. To do the same amount of work with a heavier fluid, you need more horsepower, right? And then gasoline, the same thing. Same amount of work, less pressure, sorry, uh, less horsepower, OK? All right, so we talked about, well, maybe that wasn't out of line then. OK, I apologize, folks. All right, so. Now we talked horsepower. So now let's talk uh, efficiency, and then we'll get into a full-fledged performance curve, OK? So uh, every pump exhibits internal losses. Size of the loss depends on where the pump is operating on its curve, OK? Minimal or, I'm sorry, minimal or substantial. So every pump is designed kind of for a, a, a very specific flow, right? In our first example, it was 50, and then you move to the left and to the right of there. Right? And as you move to the left or the right, you, although you may still be in a hydraulically acceptable part of the pump, you are in a less efficient part of the pump. So where that efficiency is highest is called, we just call it BEP, best efficiency point. So this now is a little more uh, indicative of what I'd say is a full-fledged uh, performance curve. So in this case, this is a full serve. This is a LR. It's a single stage double suction pump running at 1750 RPM, OK? Here are all of the impeller diameters ga guides that you can put in this pump. Now, theoretically, the number of impeller diameters you can put in this pump is infinite. So you can put seven, seven and an eighth, seven and a quarter. So you get the point, right? So whatever the, foot, whatever the flow and head is, you match it up to an impeller diameter, and that's what, the, that's what the factory trims and then balances that impeller to, is that impeller diameter that meets that flow and pressure. So here are your impeller diameters. Same thing, we have our flow gallons per minute on our x-axis and our head on the y-axis. Okay. Here are our efficiency curves. All right. So here's 70, that's a point, and then here's 68, 65. Okay. So you can see these, you have this little like here's the most efficient point, but you see kind of have these reverse apexes right here, OK? So remember, when we, in our first example, we started right here and we moved back and forth. So notice that at whatever given flow and pressure or head, this area right in here is your best efficiency operating range, right in here, right? All right, and we'll go through one of these examples. So you have efficiency lines, you have impeller diameter, and then notice right here, I'm sorry, I say it right here, right here are horsepower lines, OK? Horsepower lines, so here's three horsepower, here's five horsepower, and here's seven and a half horsepower. And I'll get back to those in just a second, OK? And then down here on a separate scale, we have uh, our NPSH line. Again, uh, NPSH is is a MPSH and cavitation is a separate one hour discussion. All right, so a couple questions. What is the best efficiency? Well, that's pretty easy. It's right there. It's 70%. What 
what is the best efficiency point? I'm sorry. Right? It, really, what it should say is, what is the flow? No, I'm sorry. I, I have it correctly. I'm sorry. What is the best efficiency point on this pump? So basically, what is the flow and head at that point? 70%, 250 gallons a minute. A, what did I say? Yeah, 75 feet ahead. Okay, right there. Okay. Now, quick comment on this. So if you have an application for 250 gallons a minute at 75 feet of head, am I going to quote this pump to you? Well, I, I, I sure as heck hope not. And if anybody else does, you need to question it. Why, I would say? Because even though it's the best efficiency point, this pump is maximum impeller diameter right here. You can't get any more than 10. So let's say instead of 75 feet, and, and that was your calculation and it was perfect, uh, you know, you, you didn't see that there was a 30-foot section of 3-inch pipe instead of 2-inch, I'm sorry, 3-inch pipe instead of 4-inch pipe. Well, now that incre increases the restriction. It increases your dynamic losses. And as a result, your head is not 75 feet, it's 80 feet. All right, now we're up here. Well, now instead of being able to just take the impeller out, put a new impeller in in a different trim, now you have to buy a whole new pump. All right? So just that's kind of a little side point. Never, we should, you should never be specifying and we should never be supplying an impeller, a pump at max impeller, unless you're running it off a variable speed drive. All right, so 175 gallons a minute, 50 feet of head. What's the impeller diameter? 175 gallons a minute, 100, I'm sorry, 50 feet of head right here. I would say that impeller diameter is 7 and 3 quarter inches, roughly. Um, what is the brake horsepower? So we haven't done a calculation, but let's just eyeball it. 150 at 50, all right, right there. So here's our three horsepower line and here's our five horsepower line so right there you're it looks like you're just a hair over three horsepower so you might be at 3.1 horsepower okay what is your run out flow in head all right good question so here's where you are remember the pump can now run anywhere on that uh, 50 feet, sorry, right here. There you go. So you can run anywhere on that eight, seven and a half, maybe a little, maybe seven and five eighths line, right there. Okay. So that means you can run all the way back here if the system allows you, or you can run all the way out here. All right. So you open your valve all the way. You're running all the way out here. Now your run out flow is probably 225 gallons a minute, and your pre I'm sorry, I keep losing my mouse, and your Head is roughly, well, it looks like maybe 36 feet or so, okay? Same thing is true going back. Shut off, obviously you're at zero flow and you're at maybe 58 feet of head, okay? So that's, ba that's the basics of a, uh, a centrifugal pump curve. And again, 99% of pumps, centrifugal pumps, will look something like that. Okay, now... So we said the pump's going to run anywhere it can on the curve, all right? But where, what determines where it runs on the curve? Well, that's called the system curve. There's two components in a system curve, the static head and the dynamic head. So we are now on the discharge, we're going to a analyze or evaluate the discharge side of your system, okay? So static head, that's a pretty easy one, all right? So how much work does this pump have to do just to get the fluid up to the tank that's on the second or third floor, right? Notice it's water level to water level, so it's not upper water level down to the pump center line, right? Because if, if this pump is not running, this amount of work has always been already been done just by filling the tank, okay? So it's here to here. For our example, let's say it's 20 feet, okay? That's static cut. Doesn't matter what size pipe, how much run of pipe you have, 20 feet's 20 feet. Dynamic cat, friction loss. It's a function of the fluid velocity running through the pipe. So, constant pipe diameter. Lower flow means lower head loss, and higher flow means higher head loss. So, 
you have a four inch pipe, does it conceptually make sense that if you try to put 800 gallons per minute through a four inch pipe versus 400 gallons per minute through a four inch pipe, you're going to have more pressure drop, more friction, more head loss with the higher flow. Right? Again, I think that's intuitive. Right? Now, if you have a constant flow, larger pipe diameter, less head loss. Right? 500 gallons a minute, if you have a 6-inch pipe versus a 4-inch pipe, you have less restriction, you have lower dynamic head loss. Okay? So it's really a function of not just the distance of your discharge piping, right? You you got four elbows, you got 600 feet of pipe, you got to go up three floors over, but how far you go up doesn't matter. That's static. All you want to do is count the total length of pipe you have, what the diameter is, and what the flow going through it that you want. Okay. So. Here we have, I just took a, uh, we're going we're gonna to put a performance curve on top of this, but all we're going to do now is draw our system curve. So at 20 feet, remember, regardless of flow, 20 feet is 20 feet, whether you're pumping 20 gallons a minute or 2,000 gallons a minute. So at 20 feet, we just draw a line right across here. That's our static head, right? Now, at 30 gallons, and there's a calculation, you know, we can just look right in the Cameron Hydraulic Book and, and actually see the calculation. Most of you, many of you maybe have, have done that calculation. But again, I just want to see if you understand the, the, the concept. I want to make sure you understand the concept. My apologies. So 30 gallons a minute, you have this right here amount of, of dynamic head loss. So let's say the dynamic head loss is 10 feet. So now you're up to 30 feet, OK? Well, again, conceptually, does it make sense that when you move out to 70 gallons a minute, constant pipe size, now you have more dynamic head loss. In this case, you're up to 40, so you went from 20 to 30, 30 to 40, okay? When you're at 100 gallons per minute in this example, and I, then we go from 20 up to 50, all right? So the total head that you have to design the system for that you tell us that you need us to size the pump for is your 20 static plus your 30 in dynamic 50 feet ahead. That's a very simplistic way to look at it, all right? So where will the pump operate? I just want to check if there are any questions. Sorry. So where will the pump operate? Pump and system curve intersection. All right. So here's our pump curve. All right. Remember, we said it can run anywhere here. In this specific example, wherever you end up drawing this system curve, and then wherever you overlay that pump curve, right there is exactly where you're going to run that pump. Okay. Wherever your system curve intersects your pump curve, that's where your pump's going to run. If you change your system curve, i.e., change the system dynamic in some way, increase your static, you're going to go from, instead of going 20 feet, you're going to go to the third floor and you're going to go to a tank at 30 feet. Well, now you've increased your, your overall system curve look. If you, uh, you're not running to that tank anymore, you're running to another tank that's 50, 50 feet further away, you've put that much more dynamic friction into your system that's going to change the shape of your system curve. And it's going, to, it's going to push where you run that pump on the curve. OK. So we've already gone through this, so we're going to, we'll kind of go through this quick, right? So here's my pump curve. Here's my system curve, all right? I'm going to close my valve. Right? I'm going to add more restriction. My flow is going to go down. My pressure is going to go up. Notice my head. Notice this is a very flat, this is a very pretty flat pump performance curve. So even though I've seen a pretty good drop in flow, I have seen very little incremental uh, head. And that's just a system of, or that's just a function of how this particular pump was designed. If I close my valve more, I run back here. Okay? All right, so 
okay, you know what? I have too much pressure in my system with this 10-inch impeller damper. What can I do? I don't need all this pressure. All right, let's trim your impeller. Let's go from 10 to 9.2. All right, no big deal, because what I'm just going to do is I'm going to drop from 245 straight down. Uh, the, so I won't lose any flow. I'll stay at 245, and I'll go from 280 you know, feet of head down to 240 feet of head. Mission accomplished, right? Because all I did is drop my impeller damper. Well, no, that's not how it works. You're going to follow the system curve. So yes, you're going to go down to 240 feet of head, but you're all go also going to go down to 220 or so gallons per minute because you have to because that's where the in intersection of your pump curve and your system curve is. I have a, I have a the max impeller diameter, I, and I have a, a variable frequency drive, and I'm running right here. I'm running at 220 at, you know, let's just call it 250, okay? It's too fast. I don't need all this head. I don't need all this pressure. I don't need all this head. Let's just drop it. No problem. Slow the pump down, okay? When you slow the pump down to 1180, you're not going to drop all the way down here, all right? So you're not going to maintain this flow. You're going to follow this system curve back, and wherever that speed intersects your new curve, which, again, that's your new speed curve, so you have accomplished running at 100, you have accomplished dropping your head from 250 down to, you know, 110, but you've also dramatically decreased your flow from 225 down to 125, all right? So it's wherever the system curve hits your pump, your pump curve. All right, a couple more. We're at two. We're about, right about 45 minutes now. We got uh, maybe two, I think three, or four more slides, and we'll we'll call it a day. So let's just talk about pumps uh, pumps in parallel and if, uh, how they're affected by system curves. So pumps in parallel at the same head, the flow rates add. Right? There's not series where the head the pressure adds, the head adds. These are in, these are in parallel. So the flow rates add. The pumps have to be, if not identical, pretty close to be, or they're going to start fighting each other. Yeah, we'll talk about minimum flow, and we'll talk about wide flow rates. All right, so here's my single pump curve, right? This is a pump that's, uh, you know, it's probably a 200 to 250 gallon per minute pump right here, okay? All right, well, if I turn two pumps on, in theory, Right here is what my curve looks like, right? I've gone from a 250 gallon per minute pump to roughly a 500 gallon per minute pump. Run out here is 300, run out here is 600, all right? One pump curve, two pump curve. Here's my system curve, okay? So right now I'm running at 220 gallons a minute at 240 feet ahead, right there, all right? Holy cow, holy cow, we turn another I, don't know, so I was going to say a cooling tower, but it probably is a dedicated pump. But something happened in the system such that we need dramatically more flow. That's okay. We have an inline spare. Turn that spare on. Let's get the ball rolling. Okay. You turn that in. You turn that spare on. Now you have two pumps running. Uh, that's going to be great because instead of 220 gallons a minute, I'm going to run out here to 420 gallons a minute. Well, that's not the case. All right. There's my first point. There's my second point, because that's where I've now crossed the, 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 that's where my system curve has crossed my two pump curve, right? You're dumping two pumps into the same main header. So your system curve doesn't change, right? Just your flow rate does. So you've gone from, you know, 220, or I'm sorry, 210 to 215. You've had a 5% increase in flow. What's happening? Well, what's happening is your pump pumps, now plural, are running exactly where they're supposed to be, which is where they intersect your system curve. But here's the real kicker with this, right? That's two pumps operating total. So that means each pump is now operating back at, you know, 105 to get you 210. So now what you've done is you've pushed both pumps back to the left, and now you've put yourself in danger that you're running, you know, to the left or close to that minimum thermal or minimum, you know, continuous flow line. So now you've put your pump in a hydraulically unstable position. So you can see, and, the, and this system curve is relatively steep, 
right? So because it's relatively steep, you just don't have a lot of flexibility here in a two-pump system. So if you're going to put an inline spare in that you plan to use, you really need to understand your system, and you need to design your system to have a relatively flat curve as opposed to a relatively steep curve. Here's your example, right? Here's my single pump curve. That's where it intersects, right at 300. In fact, that's not a good place. See how far out to the right that curve is right there, right? Two pumps operating should be way out here to 600, okay? Not a good point. Parallel operation now, you go here, which is, looks like a little less than 500 gallons a minute. So you've gone from 295 out to close to 500. Note, you haven't doubled your flow, right? But you have a nice flat system curve. So instead of 4-inch pipe, you put in 6-inch pipe. All right? Instead of 15 elbows, you've made it a straight run to the tank. So you've made a nice flat system curve. So you're never going to do double this flow, right? That's, that's impossible because you always have increased friction with increased flow. But you, you now have had a nice flat curve, so now you get all the, this benefit right here of parallel operation at 500 gallons a minute, which also means each pump is pushed back to 250 gallons a minute. Now you're running right in the sweet spot of that pump. All right. So you need to know not just what your system curve is, but what the shape of your system curve is. Okay. All right, folks. That's it. It's 250. I don't. Uh, I, I don't see any questions. I, okay. I see a couple. Thank you. Okay. Good. So, if anybody has any questions. Uh, now or after, if you don't want to do it on here, uh, call me or email me and we'll go from there. I do appreciate everybody uh, tuning in and hopefully you can all tune in uh, the following month for the mechanical seal basis. Thanks everybody. Have a great day.